So if you have your Bible this morning, turn with me to the book of Daniel, and we're going to be looking only at the first two verses, because I want to introduce the book of Daniel to you. I want you to know, want you to know in, a, in a broad sense how it came to be that Israel, who God had opened up the land of Canaan to them and ushered them in by a mighty hand. You only have to look at the, at the books of the Bible to see that. How they came to be exiled from their own land and captives in another country. If for no other reason than it not befall us that we fall captive to this world as God's people. So in the book of Daniel chapter 1, we read the beginning of the story in the first two verses. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, into the house of his God, and brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. How can it be, my friends, that Israel, who had been chosen by God to be the nation through which the Messiah would come, the whole purpose of this nation being to uh, bring about the Messiah into the world, the one who would pay the debt and cleanse uh, the world from their sins. How can it be that they would find themselves in such predicaments? Well, it happens the way it does for most people as well. Now, God deals with nations in a certain way, and he, and he deals with nations as nations, and He deals with people as people. It's, it is wrong to uh, try to put the same kind of working that God does with a nation with people. But I think that there are similarities in the two that, that we can understand, that we can see. For instance, the Bible says that God gave Israel into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. Why would God do that? Would, if it were you and you were, uh, you were bound and taken captive, wouldn't you be asking God the question? Wouldn't you be asking, why are these things happening? But what if I told you that long before any of these events transpired, long before the wickedness of the kings of Jerusalem and Judah, God had warned the nation of Israel to obey him, to follow his word. As long as they obeyed his word, that they would be protected, they would be preserved. But they did not listen. They did not heed. And this all culminated in this man, Jehoiakim. And we're going to see just how. What makes Jehoiakim, of whom the Bible says that he did evil in the sight of the Lord? This was a king of Israel. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. All of his days, there was not a time when Jehoiakim followed God. In fact, Jehoiakim was the son of Josiah. Now you may remember Bible stories of Josiah. In the book of 2 Kings, Josiah is outlined. Now keep in mind, this is the father of Jehoiakim, or Eliakim, as he was known in those days. And we'll get into the reason why for the name change. In 2 Kings, I want you to go to verse 25. This is a description of the father of Jehoiakim. So you might be saying to yourself today, well, I'll tell you what we need. We need godly parents to pass on the truth of God to their children so that their children can walk in the ways of the Lord. It is true that the Bible 
tells us that we should walk with God, that we should be good parents, that fathers and mothers should train up their children in the way they should go. When they are old, they will not depart from it. But this matter of trusting and believing God is an individual matter. A lot of children think uh, erroneously that they've been more or less uh, brought into the kingdom of God just by virtue of their parents. Their parents may be very religious, and by that I mean they, they, are, they, they go to church, they have the profession of faith in Jesus Christ, they believe that God raised him from the dead, which the Bible says is the qualification for one to be saved. If you believe Jesus Christ and that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And children often think, well, I'm, I'm in this little cocoon. My parents, you know, are saved and I'm just, I'm following along with them. I'm doing as they've done. But there's no mental assent to understanding the Word of God as how it applies to them. The Word of God tells people, it's open, it's, it's transparent. It says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And all are dead in trespasses and sins. All stand condemned before God in their natural state, in their, in their born state. But that through Jesus Christ and faith in His name, believing that God raised Him from the dead, we can have eternal life. So it, it's erroneous to think that just because the parents are, um, are believers and follow God closely that children are going to be ushered right in. They must see their state. They must come of their own accord to Christ. They must be born again. Verse 25 in the text there, 2 Kings 23, verse 25 we're talking about Josiah. And like unto him was there no king before him that turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might, according to the law of Moses. Neither after him arose there any like him. Notwithstanding, the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath, wherewith his anger was kindled against Judah because all of the provocations that Manasseh had provoked him with all. Manasseh was a, the forerunner before uh, Josiah, a wicked man and wicked towards God and the, and the people of God. And the Lord said, I will remove Judah also out of my sight as I have removed Israel and will cast off this city, Jerusalem, which I have chosen and the house which, uh, of which I said, my name shall be there. Now the rest of the acts of Josiah and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? How did we get here? How did we get to a point where Josiah turns himself so fully to the things of God and follows him he, he destroyed false altars in, in the city. He put uh, witches and those with familiar spirits out of the nation. He purified the, the people and observed the Passover, which had been forgotten for nearly 70 years. Solid. He did all of that. He turned completely to the Lord. There would never been a king like him before that turned like that. Now, there was David, a man after God's own heart. But this man completely turned to God. Gave himself wholly over from a position away from God to God. That's a conversion experience right there. And it was lived out in his life. He didn't just say he believed God and trusted God. He got a copy of the Word of God and kept it in his, uh, in his palace so that it could be read and understood by him so he could put it into practice in his nation. He cleaned up Judah as much as one man could. But his son, 
He walked in the ways of Manasseh. He walked in the ways of the evil kings. And tragedy had already befallen Israel. Israel was a nation divided, even in these times. You see, in around 700 odd BC, uh, there was a division between the tribes. You remember the son of David, Solomon? Uh, well, when Solomon died, his son Rehoboam took over the kingdom. And Rehoboam didn't have the wisdom of Solomon, didn't have the, the ability to discern how to lead like Solomon did. And he was very harsh with the people. And so in his days, the nation divided. We had the nation of Israel, which were the northern ten tribes of Israel. And then we had Judah, which was Benjamin and Judah separated out unto themselves, right? The nation had already split. And there were kings in the north and they were, they were wicked. The kings in the north were wicked, which led to them being taken away into captivity first. They were long gone in captivity. But this place, Jerusalem, which was in Judah, the nation of uh, Judah, the tribe of Judah within that nation, God had preserved. You see, God had preserved a remnant. He always preserves a remnant. We should know that about God. Whether it's nations or whether it's individuals within nations, God always preserves a remnant for himself because there are always men and women who will turn to God, even in the most wicked of nations. Look at King Josiah. He may have well, except for a few people in his court, he may have been alone in what he did because when he died, it did not take long for his son, Eliakim, to show his colors. Josiah died in battle uh, near the Euphrates River. Uh, yeah, near the Euphrates River with King Necho of Egypt. And this is gonna, this is gonna really come back to, to burn uh, uh, Eliakim. But Josiah decided he would ride out. He was talked into riding out. He, he, was, he, he was doing the wrong thing. He had connected himself with the, the wrong kings and, and, and he hadn't really asked the wisdom of God in this matter and he went out and he was killed, struck by an arrow, down he went, he died. And King Necho, who was, uh, or Pharaoh Necho, who was the victor in the battle, came into Jerusalem, didn't he? He came in there and he took the son of, uh, of Josiah, who was on the throne, took him captive, brought him back to Egypt to sit in his courts. And he died there, uh, sitting at the table of, of, uh, of the person who killed his father. And he put onto the throne Eliakim, the younger son, uh, and, and put him on the throne. He was about 25 years old when, when he began to reign. He had learned nothing. He had not seen with his eyes what Josiah, his father, had done. He did not pattern his kingdom after Josiah, but he patterned it after all of the wicked kings that had preceded Josiah. The reason why God was so angry with, with uh, Judah. Just listen to what happened. They changed his name. His name was Eliakim. That's a wonderful name. It means God will establish. So if, if, you, if you have a child, Eliakim's a great name. Um, to think that God is going to establish you. But see, Pharaoh Necho, having defeated Josiah and, and having the king that took over uh, sitting at his table, uh, as, as a conquered uh, person and using him, no doubt, as leverage uh, against uh, 
Eliakim, changed his name to Jehoiakim. Now, Jehoiakim means established by God. See the slight difference? God will establish and established by God. So what was Necho saying, the great Pharaoh of Egypt? I am God. I have removed a king. Remember, God takes kings down. And I have set up a king. I am God. I have established you. It was a, if, if Eliakim would have been a man of God, it would have been a knife in his heart. But I doubt that it meant anything to him. Look at this man, Jehoiakim. Not a man of God. But it, this was a subtle reminder that Pharaoh Necho was his God. And funny, but people have been saying this throughout the ages, right? To the people of God. They've been trying to, to put us somehow in subjection. You know, well, you know, you've got to, you, you uh, have to be in my control, under my power. You do what I say. Your Savior, your Savior isn't here. You do what I tell you to do. No. If we walk like Josiah walked, and, and we do in Christ, then we follow Jesus and His words. We're happy, and we, we by the way, we make the best citizens uh, when we walk uprightly and according to the word of the Lord, we make the, the best citizens that any nation could ever hope to have. Christians who follow Christ and who endeavor to live according to His ways and principles are the best citizens of any nation. And we're happy to follow individuals as long as they don't transgress the Word of God. When they transgress away from God and ask us to do likewise, we have to politely say, no, we will not do it. Men have stood up, women have stood up through the ages, and they have given their bodies to be burned. They have, they have been pulled asunder. They have been sawn asunder because they would not lay down the, the good word of God. They would not lay it aside to follow the words and deeds of men. And I don't know about you, but that, that's where I stand. I, you say, well, you, you say it awfully confidently. Aren't you afraid? Oh, yes. I am very afraid to die. Who would not be? Who would not be afraid to to go against and a recognized authority, especially a state authority, looking at what can happen to individuals now. But I have no choice. I have to lean on God and trust in Him. Now this man, Eliakim or Jehoiakim, as Pharaoh Necho named him, he kept Judah in subjection. You, listen to this. He said to Pharaoh Necho, you, you let us stay here. This is what we're going to give you. We're going to give you a uh, hundred talents of silver. We're going to give you a talent of gold every year. Do you know how much that is? We'll put it in today's dollars, shall we? In Australian dollars. Every year they were giving Pharaoh Necho $3.5 million in silver and $3.17 million in gold every year. That was their tribute to Pharaoh. And how do you think Jehoiakim got it? Jehoiakim didn't say, I come from a wealthy family. I come from the king's seed. We're going to pull everything that we have to give it out that way. We're not going to put a burden on the people. No, of course not. No, this is his decision, but it's their burden to bear. See, the people always suffer uh, under tyrannical governments. And so it was 
in the government of Jehoiakim over Israel. He taxed the people for silver and gold, putting a burden on them that they could hardly bear up under. They were only a small nation. It was just two tribes. The Bible says he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came against old Pharaoh Necho in Egypt. By this time, uh, uh, Judah had been under bondage about three years to Pharaoh Necho. And Nebuchadnezzar goes against him in battle and defeats him. And, of course, as any king would do in those days, he, he was not a, a believer. My friends, he was a believer in false gods. He went to solidify the parts of the kingdom which uh, Pharaoh Necho had in other areas. One of those was Judah in Jerusalem. And he besieged the city. And he took away people captive. And he um, took away part of the uh, goods of the temple. All of the vessels that they used in, in uh, doing the incense and all of those things. He took them all. Silver, gold. He took them all. He didn't take everything. He just took what was at hand. You know, just a little conquest, let's take that, we'll bring that back with us. And they put it in the treasure house of his false god in Shinar. And after years of being in tribute uh, to uh, Babylon, Jehoiakim rebelled. And that was the end of Jehoiakim. The Bible tells us that that he died without God. I, it, my mind is blown that he would die without God outside of the city. He was being dragged away as a captive and he, and he died. And you know what? No one mourned him. Not one person. They didn't mourn him. They didn't weep and wail. Uh, they didn't put on sackcloth. They didn't uh, have, have periods of, of, of great uh, self-trial and mourning over it at all. Because a wicked man, a man without God, had died. In 586 B.C., the people of Israel went captive into Babylon. And there was a, it was done in stages, of course, as, uh, as all things happen. Why did these things have to happen? Did not Josiah turn? So, see, we're thinking about things in terms of an individual. If an individual sees the error of his ways, sees what the word of the Lord says about him, and he turns to God like you and I did, and says, oh Lord, your word says that I am separated. My sins have separated between me and you. And, and I, I am dead in trespasses and sins. And your condemnation is resting upon me. Be merciful to me. Jesus died. See, see where we're going with this? That we completely turn. We make a complete about face. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe in the gospel that he's risen from the dead. That makes a change in a life. And the Bible says it brings everlasting life. Where there was death, there is life. But we're talking about nations here. One good king, King Josiah, one good king could not turn God's anger away from the nation of Judah. There had been so many wrongs, so much disobedience, so much, uh, I would even say breaking of the word of God. They didn't even attempt to follow the word of God. In Josiah's day, that was the first time the Passover had been observed. 
as long as any living person could remember. That was it. And it didn't happen again, by the way. They didn't do as God said. He said, let the land lay fallow the seventh year, and I'll make the sixth year's produce double. There'll be plenty there to carry you through to the following year. You just leave everything as it is, and then eat of the fruit that just grows naturally, the, the uh, seed that naturally springs up. I'll make it to get you through. It shows their dependence on God. But they were wicked. And God said, even though Josiah be who he is, I'm going to send this nation, I'm giving them into the hands of the Egyptians. I'm giving the, the items out of the, the tabernacle into their hands. I'm letting them take those things, or the temple. I'm letting them take those things. They can put them in the houses of their God. The Israelites don't, don't want them. The nation of Judah doesn't care. Jehoiakim, like those uh, kings before him, except his father Josiah, despised the word of God. Look with me to Jeremiah chapter 36. We're going to find out a little bit about this man. Jeremiah chapter 36. Beginning in uh, verse 20. Well, let's go back to verse 19, just for a bit of context. Then said the princes unto Baruch, Go hide thee, thou and Jeremiah. See, he was a contemporary with Jeremiah the prophet. And let no man know where ye be. And they went into the king, into the court, but they laid up the roll. This is the scroll that had been written by Baruch of the words of Jeremiah. Jeremiah had preached the words to him and Baruch the scribe had written them down on a, on a scroll. Several leaves on a, on a single scroll. And they were judgments against Judah because of the sins of their kings and the sins of the nation. He says, and they went into the, in verse 20, and they went into the king, into the court, but they laid up the roll in the chamber of Elishama the scribe, and told all the words in the ears of the king. So the king sent Jehudi in to fetch the roll, and he took it out of Elishama the scribe's chamber, and Jehudi read it in the ears of the king, and in the ears of all the princes which stood beside the king. Now the king sat in the winter house in the ninth month, and there was a fire on the hearth burning before him. And it came to pass that when Jehudi had read three or four leaves, that's three or four pages of the writing in the scroll, that King uh, Jehoiakim, with his pen, he cut it with the pen knife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. Yet they were not afraid, nor rent their garments, neither the king nor any of his servants that heard all these words. You see, jo Josiah had changed. One man had changed. The nation was still the same. Can you imagine taking the word of God and out of anger at what you see there, what you read, burning it? Remember, this was the only scroll. This had been uh, rehearsed by, uh, by the prophet into the ears of Baruch. And, and he had him write it just as he spoke it. And he did. Scribes write faithfully everything that they hear. And now this word of God, which pronounced judgments against Judah and her kings and, 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 and all, was gone. It had been cut, thrown in the fire. But the Bible says that the word of God is forever. So you know what God said? He said, take 
another scroll, go back to Baruch and write again all of those things that were on the first scroll. And the Bible says that it happened, that all of those prophecies were written again in that scroll and several others beside were added to it of what God was going to do. You see, man can't take away or hide the word of God from others. Men for ages have been trying to do that with this book. They, they have changed it by their variations, by their alterations, many of which take out the blood of Jesus Christ and, and take away the most important parts of it. Many of them also misinterpret it and do so with knowledge to drag away people to themselves. But the Word of God always stands on its own two feet. The Word of God shall not be destroyed. Jehoiakim can burn it, but God will destroy Jehoiakim. And that's exactly what he did. He didn't make it into Babylon. He died. And he died outside of the city. And he died in a place where no one mourned him. They looked at him on the side of the road, no doubt, like he was a dead dog and walked on. This man who had done such horrible damage to the nation and who had plunged them uh, it back to the same uh, evils that they had had before. I wonder too, and this is where I think we can bring this message into today. We find ourselves in much a similar situation, perhaps as a nation, uh, but I'm thinking more as an individual uh, challenge today. To those people who are out there, they're living their lives, probably much like uh, Josiah did. He was walking in, in the ways and learning in the ways of his evil father. But then the word of the Lord came to him and he turned, fully turned, unlike anyone that had been seen before. And I think there are others too out there who are seeing the Word of God. When you were lost, did you read the Bible? Did you read, I mean, in a tract or parts of the Bible, did you read anything like that when you were lost? I, I did. Did, you, did anyone ever share with you verses of Scripture or maybe when you were a kid? Uh, I remember being very angry where the Bible was concerned. I, I remember um, my mom, she was always so happy. And that, that, I didn't know where that kind of happiness could come from, especially since you know my father passed away when I was 12 and we moved across country. We left everyone, left everyone that I knew to go across country. I couldn't imagine how she could be so happy, but she seemed to be very happy. And I might have told you before, she would leave tracks around, like just sort of put them here and there. They'd be on a, on the, you know, maybe a coffee table. And I'd pick them up and look at them. I, I still remember one of them. It was a chick track, by the way. I still remember that one. And that one helped me out when I got to uh, university too. And I wasn't even saved, but it was a very helpful track for when I got there. But I remember there was a time when I thought, there might be something in this. And just so happened that on TV came a TV preacher. Now it's not like today's TV preachers. This was a local guy from Little Rock, Arkansas. He was a Baptist. I don't know. I don't know what kind of Baptist he was. I, didn't, I wasn't saved anyway. But he, he was talking about all of the words of Jesus in your Bible are in red. And I thought, really? And I start looking. I'm looking through. Of course, I don't know where to start looking. I'm looking through. The, I don't find anything. Finally, I get into the New Testament, and there it is. There are actually words in red. 
And I thought, I'm gonna read those. You know, forget what these other guys say, they don't care what they say, just they wanna see what he said. And I got a bit of a ways through that and I went like this. I closed the book and I thought, uh, that's not for me. And I think this is what happened to Jehoiakim. There was probably anger involved in his. Mine was more, uh, I don't think I want to read any more of that because it was very, very much putting pressure on me, right? It's one of the very first ways, you know, I was still young. God was working with me. He worked with me over decades, my friend. Decades it took for, for me to finally come around. But, but I think Jehoiakim was like that. He heard the first few pages and he said, cut that book and throw it in the fire. All he prophesies is evil against our nation and our people. And that's, that's exactly what I thought. There's nothing, there's nothing good in this for me. I'm, I'm in trouble. And I quickly forgot it, just like you do. It, it wasn't two weeks and the devil had pulled it all out of my head. It was all gone. At least I thought it was gone. The memory was gone anyway. And uh, I went blindly and blissfully on my way with, without a worry in the world until the next time that God would deal with me, maybe a year, maybe a little bit less. He would bring it, and then all of those other things would come flooding back to my mind as well. And then I'd, I'd have to work to get them out of my head and go on, you know, and, and finally get the victory over the Word and go, and go about my foolishness again. Let me tell you what the Bible says. You can tell your friends this too who are unsaved because what was true of a nation back then is true of individuals now. The Word of God is the most important thing. Now, in their day, the Word of God was promises, right? Especially promises relating to the Messiah and, and His coming kingdom. And, and they had people, we know this in the days of Jesus and before, who were looking for His coming. They were anticipating it. They were praying that it would come. They were believing that God was going to provide a Messiah. This is what He said, the Father said, in Matthew 17, 5, while He yet spake, this is at that uh, oft discussed by me, uh, Mount of Transfiguration. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Do you remember that? Peter, James, and John. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. How about that for a word from God? Hear ye him. John 14, 6 says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There is not one that will be saved who does not come through Jesus Christ. He's declared it. And the Father has said, I love him. He pleases me. Hear ye him. Listen to what he has to say. John uh, 10, 24 through 30. Jesus said, I told you, uh, I told you, and ye believe not the works that I do in my Father's name. They bear witness to me, but ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. You see, these claims that Jesus was making had substance and had backing because of those 
uh, words that were recorded in the Gospel of John. In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. People say, Jesus didn't create the world. That's crazy talk. You're just trying to say that the word is Jesus and that Jesus created the world. That's silliness. Listen to verse 9. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, that is his own people, the Jewish nation, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And the Bible goes on to say, and John bear him witness. Brethren, the word of God has taken human form in Jesus Christ. He is the Son of God, sent by the Father to pay the debt for sins. You see, it's the same, it's the same problem. The, the book... The word that we have before us tells us that we are in need of a Savior. But the same book also tells us that a Savior has been provided. Isn't it great that the, the, the condemnations, the, the words of, of death and destruction are mitigated by the coming of Jesus Christ? The purpose of that word is to both wake you up, to make you see where you stand, and in Jesus Christ and your knowledge of Him, to settle accounts with God and to have no accounts with Him. Which is why Romans 8, 1 can say, there is therefore now no condemnation, none, to them who are in Christ Jesus who walk or who have their life, not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. And then verse, verse 9, I think it is, of uh, Romans chapter 8 tells you that if the Spirit of God dwell in you, then He is your life. You are alive spiritually. The promises of God are true. The Word is true. Brethren, this whole world is in captivity. They're in their own Babylonian captivity. They're locked away. And however good or bad they think their current state is, what is coming is far worse. That's why we sound, uh, to them at least, so crazy. You must be born again. Hell is sweeping toward us. Death is coming. Judgment is coming. A great white throne is coming. Flee. Flee into the, into the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we, to them, we sound like we're crazy men. And they, like Jehoiakim, take the penknife and put it in our word and cut it and throw it into the fire. But did the word go away? No. The word that Jehoiakim heard with his ears was in his mind. It never went away. It was recreated by the prophet Jeremiah and Baruch the scribe. It was recreated and brought back into existence with more added to. It doesn't matter what we think. It doesn't matter how many times we reject and turn away from the Word of God, 
saying this is not for us. The Word of God provides our only means of escape. Now you and I know this. Uh, th this is why preaching to the converted uh, is, is sometimes hard, uh, hard to do, hard to make people understand that what we're talking about here is the world. Think of your own state, right? You were lost, dead in trespasses and sins, and so are they. They, they are someone's son. They are someone's uh, daughter. They are someone's father, mother, grandfather, grandmother. It just may not be ours. But that doesn't mean that their lives and souls are not important. And though, though they put a penknife through the Word of God and say, oh, I don't want it, the Word of God remains true. Maybe out there, there's a, a Josiah. Maybe out there, there's someone who is going to turn. You know, in your whole life, you, you witness to hundreds of people and you've seen very little result for your labor. And you think, why do we do this? We do it because out there, there is a Josiah who will see their ways and turn, just like I did. I was lost and, and dead. And I put a penknife in the Word of God and said, I don't, I don't need it, I don't want it, over and over again. But God kept bringing His Word back to me. Maybe there is a Josiah out there. We need to be sharing the Word. And it need not be complicated. It need be as simple as Jesus. I don't think you really need to convince people that they're sinners. I'm pretty sure they know that anyway. That they might quibble with you over the degree, but all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Most people would agree with that. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We need to get that word to the masses. We need to make sure that they're not going to go into exile, that they're not going to go to uh, an eternity separated from God.